I like your writing style. How 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 much is the way he talks and the way you write how you are? Does that make sense at all? Well, you know, they say that the the best way to write is to write about what you know. And so, yeah, I model a lot of what he does off the way I act and the way I talk. Um, a lot of other characters are modeled off other people that I know or or like Sarge in the books. He's modeled after Arlie Ermey and the way he acts and talks, um, you know, because truth is always stranger than fiction. It's always better. You, the old term, you know, you just you just can't make this stuff up. So um, trying to keep it grounded in, in, in reality and, and, and real people, it just makes it better, in my opinion. So. Um, you know, I I was in the Marine Corps for a little while, but I was discharged early. But I spent over 20 years working in heavy industrial construction. And those guys were a vast, varied, colorful bunch. And a lot of it comes from people that I've dealt with over the years. Cool. Yeah, and if anybody that's watching right now, if you guys have questions for Chris, that's what this is all about. Uh, fire got away. On here. Yeah, yeah, fire away. Um, I, I did notice in your in your book when I was reading it, I was like, man, this dude has got everything is, you know, he's got this, he's got that. <laughs> and then I started thinking about it and I was like, you know, if I was put in a situation like that to the average person, they would probably think the same thing about me. And I think yeah. preppers in general are kind of like that. We just have so much crap that, you know, maybe we'll never need it. Maybe we will. But uh we almost kind of feel naked if we don't have it. You know what I mean? <laughs> Absolutely. You know, and, and people always talked about his bag and how it wasn't realistic. Well, Morgan's bag weighed 65 pounds. That's a very heavy bag. Yeah. But then they would also complain that Morgan only walked about 10 miles a day. Anybody can walk farther than that. Well, all right. Yesterday you're bitching that he was carrying a 65 pound pack. Today you're complaining <laughs> he's not walking far enough. Do the math, fellas. Um, yeah. cause, cause well, what I did is even- I pulled my bag out. And just use the contents of it in that story. That was literally how it happened. Yeah, and you even made the caveat in the book that, hey, I'm going to take all this crap, and whether I, if I can't carry it, I'll dump it on the way. Uh, I'll, I'll start losing it because, you know, it's it's yeah. easy to get rid of stuff. It's, you know, it's harder to get things um, when you're out like that, you know. Yeah. You know, you think about, like, the Mormon Trail. It looked like a yard sale, all the stuff that they would throw out of wagons and things because they <laughs> just couldn't get it no more. It's the same kind of theory. You know, you start off with, uh, you know, the, you know, pie in the sky hopes and dreams and and then when reality sets in after a couple of days of lugging that around you might start really reevaluating exactly what you care what you're carrying what do i really need <laughs> in the first book when uh when all the power goes out and he, the first thing he does is get out go through his bag and start hucking dropping stuff off and you know that and that's a great way to do it i drive around i have a pickup truck with a uh one of those aluminum covers on the back of the bed Man, yeah. I got, I have a truck full of stuff, but I'm not going to carry it all. But you know what? When I go to start, when I go to start hoofing it, I won't be for want of not having what I need, man. It'll be there. Oh, absolutely. I'm yeah. the same way. I mean, the bed of my truck stays about a third packed at all times with my, my pack, um, tactical rig, weapons, ammo, extra food. Plus I have a North American rescue full pack in there, which is a whole nother pack. I don't carry that with the intention of, ever walking home with it, but I carry that in case I come across somebody who needs help. Um, and, and the sort of other gear, water, food, all kinds of stuff back there. Because I'm vehicle mounted, I don't have to carry it, so I'm going to tote everything that I think I may ever want or need, you know. And, and if I have to abandon the truck, I'm going to go through it, I'm going to take the stuff that I know I need, I'm going to take those three road flares out from under the back seat that are taped together, I'm going to light them, I'm going to throw them in the front seat, and I'm going to walk away from it, so... Yeah. I'm not leaving nothing for nobody. I'm glad you're carrying that North American Rescue bag. Just putting a plug in for my company, not my company, the company I work for. So, yeah, yeah. no, I mean, yeah, I've got one of your kits with the the full letter, the the foldable letter in it, and and everything. Nice. It's a full kit. Um, and my group, we use it when we're training. Uh, anytime we're doing weapons training, that's staged. The the litter is assembled and waiting. Um, we decide which vehicle we're going to use for an ambulance for that day, who's calling 911, and everybody's trained up on what to do should we actually have an accident, you know, accident and somebody get hurt. I did it before. I surprised them before, and we made them simulate it right in the middle of a range day, and, and everybody responded perfectly, and everything went well. So practice, you know, makes perfect. Nice. Hey, uh, Joe, Joe Gock, in the, uh, he's one of the guys watching the uh, Facebook Live right now. Um, Joe asks... Lots of vehicles still work in the series. 
He said he was not ready for that after reading William Fortune's uh, Fortune series. Uh, was that to help the books progress faster or to allow more options? Honestly, the, the reality of it is there will be many more vehicles running than are even in my books. Um, the effects of EMP, there's, there's so much that goes into the mechanics of what will be damaged and what won't. Um, altitude of the blast, the distance of the vehicle from the blast, the orientation of the vehicle to the blast, even even which way it's facing, you know, head on to the side, to the rear. Um, if it's in a parking garage, uh, if it's under a metal structure, there, there's a lot, a whole lot that goes into it. And there'll be a number of vehicles that may die in the initial uh, event, but if you wait about 15 minutes, they're going to start back up. So and I've done a lot of research, and, and I've got a friend that works for a lab that goes around testing government facilities for things like uh, radio leaks. I'm going to call it, I'm going to say radiation leaks, but we're talking about radio and any kind of signal leaks. And they also test EMP stuff. Um, I sent him some Faraday bags to test, um, as well as some other methods we tested. They tested them to mil-spec standard. So uh, I'm learning a lot more about this. You know, like your cell phone will probably survive an EMP. You know, EMP is uh, cumulative. So the something, the more load you're going to attract um, and build up, and that's how things get destroyed. So your cell phone, very small antenna. Um, cell towers, huge ass antenna, they're going to burn up. So the phone may work, but you'll have no service. But you know, any PDFs or data you have stored on there may actually still survive. But then some, some may burn up. So. And the, the caveat to that is kind of if they're plugged in, they're probably going to be fried because that is oh. the part of the antenna, yeah. If they're uh, tied but, into the grid, yeah, if they're tied into the grid, anything tied to the grid is, it will be gone. Uh, such a massive load that comes through that uh, anything tied to the grid will pretty much be fried. Yeah, and that that is a common misconception, too, with cars. Everybody just or a lot of people just kind of assume that anything that's newer than 1980, whatever, is just going to be is going to be toast. And and it's it really just we just have no idea, and it's it's really not true. It could only be ten percent of the cars that are actually that that won't function. I mean, granted, that would be enough to cause a lot of havoc, but that and the fact that if you once you run out of gas, you don't have a car anyway. Exactly, oh. and two, and it, it, it will be a, a scalable thing. So let's say there's a detonation over Kansas. So let's everything in Kansas may be fried, but as you move out. You'll eventually find a line where you start seeing there's some dead vehicles. Hey, there's still some working vehicles. And as you move away from that epicenter, you'll find more and more and more functioning vehicles. So, there, like I said, there's a lot that goes, a lot of math that goes into that. Um, so don't just write them off. And what frustrates me is people that in the preparation community that they focus everything they do around the fact that an EMP is going to destroy electronics. So they try to not have anything. That's electronic. Well, we may have an EMP someday, but you still got to live your life, you know, and this stuff's mm -hmm. available. And I'm going to use every bit of technology I can right up to the day that I no longer can use it. And then I'll go to plan B. Yeah. Now, you mentioned something earlier that um, a lot of cars will sh shut down during, it pos uh, during an EMP. And then 15 minutes later, they'll start back up. What's the deal behind that? I don't know the mechanics behind that, but I did get that from somebody at a lab um, oh. that, who conducted tests. Um, some cars would be fried outright. Some cars, after about a 15-minute wait, um, they would restart. What? I don't know if it's a deal with capacitance and capacitors or in, in cars and that sort of thing, but um, a lot of them started up. Now, some of the cars that started up had issues. Some systems in the vehicles wouldn't work, but they started up and they would run. And really, in that world, that's all you care about. So, yeah. so if you know if the EMP yeah. ever goes off, don't just walk away from your car. Give it an hour or so and try it a few times to see what happens. And and that is the case to be made for like the the diesel vehicles, the older vehicles, because they have less of those components that could fail. Uh, the newer vehicles and stuff. I mean, you, there's computers and stuff that if the computer doesn't work, your alternator doesn't work. So that could be yeah. a huge issue. Absolutely. Uh, so, yeah. So it's. I mean, it, it's. It's kind of a type of thing. Also, you were talking about how with the epicenter of the EMP, that the the range that it has depends on the altitude it's detonated at, right? Correct. So 
to cover the entire United States in an EMP event, it would take three weapons because they're typically detonated around 250 to 300 miles up. Um, and you know, and these aren't tip, these aren't normal or typical nukes. These are finely tuned devices designed to emit as much of an electromagnetic pulse as possible, and uh, to really get blanket coverage across the entire nation, it would take three. And that would affect southern Canada and northern Mexico as well. So they wouldn't just hit us; they would hit you know lots of people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it it, could, it has the potential, just like in your books, to just be completely devastating to everything in the United States. We we kind of take for granted how much we use electricity for water treatment, sewage, all the different the refineries, all that stuff. It's not just you know the cell phones and and the televisions and the, the lights in our house and everything. I mean, we use it for everything. Uh, Absolutely everything. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah, and who knows with the power grid, um, the transformers and stuff, how long that would take to to get everything back up to speed. Well, you know, I I worked, like I said, I was in heavy industrial construction for a long time, and my specialty was power plants. Um, The transformers located at power plants, so your your generator is generating electricity, it's sending out at a very high voltage, somewhere in the neighborhood of like 144,000 volts, depending on the generators and then it goes into a step down transformer and that's where you see the, the switch yard some people think it's a substation the switch yard at the transport at the power plant um, and there's all kinds of transformers out there um, capacitors all sorts of stuff none of that material is made in the United States anymore none of that equipment wow. is made here so a lot of it comes from Germany um, some of it from South America Mexico so you're looking at having to get the stuff built, and to build one of those large transformers can take up to a year. Mm-hmm. Um, Asia builds a lot of them now, too. So you're looking at a year to start to get one, to get one built. Um, now, you know, you look at how many power plants are, there are in the nation. It will give you an idea of how long it would be. Uh, you'd be looking at a solid decade to see major progress. That's, that doesn't even mean... Um, power restored to the nation. It just means progress. And of course, the way it would happen is they would start in population centers and start working their way out. But over the course of that decade, the population centers are going to change dramatically. You know, New York City may be a population center today, but after a decade of no power and no infrastructure, it will not be a population center. Um, People will be migrating out of those places trying to find somewhere where they can actually survive. So it would be an interesting process to see how they even try to do it yeah crystal brought up a good point too is is would those countries even be willing to help us at that point and also along those lines is what countries out there would be looking to take advantage of the fact that we didn't have uh the electricity the the communications the you know i'm sure the military is probably more hardened than we probably know about but uh, you know what? How that would that would kind of put us at risk. And if these other countries are like, yeah, we'll 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 get to you. You know, we kind of like with you, you not being on the top of the hill anymore. <laughs> well, and, and just like what happens later in my series, not offering spoilers, but you know, China and Russia both step up and say we'll offer humanitarian aid to America. <laughs> you know, and once they're once they're here, they're really hard to get rid of. So. Um, That could very well happen. Uh, And, yeah, there's going to be – the day the lights go out in the United States of America, um, there will be a whole lot of additional lights all around the globe from fires and explosions and firefights that are going to be taking place because that will kick the ball off for a whole lot of people with scores to settle. Yeah. I mean, no doubt about that. And and Matthew – or yeah, Matthew Stein that was just on my podcast talked about how nuclear reactors and all that – would would melt down as well because they don't have the they've got like a week's worth of fuel uh so without the electricity to keep that water pumping in and uh, there's just so many things that we don't really think about that yeah. it could just just freaking wreak havoc uh keith had mentioned in the comment i don't know if you were going to read that or not brian um about the u.s power grid being a patchwork uh and it's it is it's a bunch of different companies um from the east stretched out to the west that kind of have their own own little power system. So um, something smaller could affect a couple. Uh, something like you were talking about, something large could affect the whole thing. But it'd well, be there's these. there's four grids in the United States. There's an eastern, a central, um, a western, and then Texas. Texas is its own grid. They're very smart. They're very smart to have done that. And 
you remember there was a, the blackout in the Northeast several years ago where one transformer went down um, at a power plant and it, called a, it caused a cascading failure. Same thing happened out west. In California, there's a transmission line that runs over a mountain range, and if that transmission line fails, it'll knock California out of power. It's one wow. single transmission line. Three strands of wire running over this mountain. Um, it's very poorly designed. You know, yeah, it might cost $10 billion to make the power grid more robust, but no one's willing to spend that money. You know, we had Hurricane Irma come through Florida. It wrecked our power grid. Um, the power company's coming to restore it, and then they go to um, down here. It's the uh, – uh, oh, I just forgot what they call it. But they, they go to the state commission asking for the per- permission to charge each um, – account, basically, a one-time fee for restoration. Now, we pay our power bills all year long. You look at their financial records and you see the billions of dollars that they profit, net profit, mm-hmm. but then they want us to pay when stuff breaks. Well, what are we paying the power company for? You know, um, They should dip into their own pockets, but they don't want to do that. They want us to then, in turn, pay for the repairs of the system that we're already paying to use. So it's, you know... Greedy folks. That's what happens when you let uh, utility companies or any company write legislation. So, yeah, it's all about the bottom line. 